as this world gets a little bit crazier uh, with each passing day, month, year, I mean, whatever time span you're talking about, it's going to be important for us to have an eternal perspective in relation to everything that's going on around us and also how things relate to us spiritually. And hopefully in the passage that we're going to look at today um, in Revelation chapter 13, it'll help to give us that that foundation of, of, of an eternal perspective and also will give us an understanding as to how that should affect the way that we live or at least how we should approach things given you know, everything that's happening in our world today. And as, as the world becomes, seems to become more and more hostile to Christianity, I think hostility to, towards Christianity has always been uh, a reality and it has its high points and, it, and its low points all throughout history. But um, I think scripture seems to be pretty clear that, you know, things will get ramped up, you know, as time goes on and having that eternal perspective um, is going to be very important. And if you have that eternal perspective, uh, you're going to be in a better position to, um, have the right thought as to how to approach things in the here and now. So that's what we want to talk about. And it's all going to be, it's all going to hinge on our understanding of, um, what we see in revelation 13 regarding the, um, the book of life of the lamb. Okay. So we are in the middle of our study of chapter 13, which is part of our longer study of the book of revelation. So we're, we're are making our way through, um, this book. It's, uh, it's been quite an adventure, um, a good adventure. And I hope that you feel the same as well. So, um, a lot of good things in store for this episode. So I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill and you're listening to loving the scriptures. All right, well, before we get into our text, um, I think most of you know what time it is. Right? Um, it's time for the uh, shameless plug, as I do every week or almost every week. I forgot I forgot to mention this. I think it was the episode before last. Um, I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, I'm back on track now and reminding you, um, if you haven't done so already, to go ahead and order my book, Signs of the End. What did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Um, so that is available, Amazon.com, uh, Amazon.com BarnesandNoble.com. Um, you can purchase it um, in electronic form as well. Um, so again, this is a book that covers Jesus' words to his disciples on the Olivet Discourse um, in answering their question on what are the signs um, of Jesus' coming and of the end of the age. Um, so uh, I, I think it'll be a good read for you. Um, so if you haven't ordered a copy already, I strongly encourage you to do so, especially if you're listening to this, uh, series on our, on our podcast, uh, dealing with the book of revelation. Um, I think that this book and revelation, you know, just kind of together kind of helps to give a, a very, uh, uh, expanded view, at least, you know, from what I view, how I view things as far as uh, the second coming eschatology and, and those sorts of things. So, um, I hope that, that you, that you, uh, go ahead and order yourself a copy that you would read it and that you would be blessed. Okay. So, um, if you read it and you are blessed by it, I think that that's a win. So, um, Signs of the End, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Okay, Revelation chapter 13 here is where we are. And um, just uh, let me go ahead and read the entire section again. We've, we've already covered a couple of areas within this within this one section here of verses 1 through of 1 through 10. Um, so far up to this point, we've gotten through verse 7. And in this episode, we're going to cover verses 8 through 10. Um, which is, you know, just kind of finishes off that section of chapter 13. It doesn't finish chapter 13. There's still other things within that chapter. Um, but um, but with as far as that section goes, uh, that goes through verse 10, we're going to finish that up now. But let me go back to verse 1 and read the entire section again. So again, we can have a full picture in our mind of, you know, just kind of what we're dealing with here. So chapter 13 uh, starting in verse one, and it says, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea 
with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the uh, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, uh, but it but its mortal wound uh, was healed, and the whole earth mar- marvelled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened it opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the for the endurance and faith of the saints. Okay, so that's the entire section there. And again, we're we're going to pick up in verse eight, which is in mid sentence. At least that's how it appears in my in my ESV here. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a review as a reminder, we don't want to. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time reviewing a lot of other things. Um, and just repeating at length things that I talk about at length in other in other episodes. But again, remember what we're dealing with here um, as it relates to as it relates to this beast that comes out of the sea. Remember what we determined um, the last couple of times that we've been on this subject is that the beast is not a a a single individual uh, end times uh, antichrist figure as a lot of people will will say that it is. And one of the big clues of that is how the beast is described. The beast is described in in language and words that draws from Daniel chapter 7, which takes elements from the four individual beasts or creatures that come out of the sea, and they're put together here in Revelation chapter 13 to give us this kind of uh, conglomeration of, of characteristics that make up this, this, this beast in this vision in Revelation chapter 13. Um, I and remember, while it's not the Antichrist, as in the end times Antichrist, I think with the beast you're dealing with a a, a whole array of different political systems, uh, ideologies, economic s- systems, whatever the case may be, that run contrary to God and the things of God and to His people. And in that, um, and you kind of get a magnified view of this as, you know, when you go into the sections of chapter 13, which we're going to look at next time, uh, dealing with the false prophet. But uh, even with the beast itself, um, I think that what you're dealing with and all of those things put together, you are dealing with many antichrists, you know, plural, because the scripture says that there are many antichrists already on the scene in the last hour. That's what you're dealing with in this conglomeration you know co- a composite sort of picture that makes up the, that makes up the beast so not the antichrist but it but i think you are in many cases dealing with the many antichrists um that show up in the last hour you know and that's you know that you get that sense between the first and second comings of jesus christ and that's the time frame again just to remind you again of what we're dealing with here we're dealing with the time between the first and second coming of christ and not a future seven-year tribulation period okay so uh, it's it's very important for us to understand that because again when we see the saints on the scene and we looked at this um last time just as it relates to um uh, you know, just kind of who we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the church in the present age right now and not tribulation saints. And a few weeks ago, we talked about how it is that or or why I believe that tribulation saints don't exist. If tribulation saints don't exist, um, then the saints that we see here who are under the heavy hand of the beast are, 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 are the church, the saints, uh, the people of God, 
Um, and this is something that the first century audience um, in Asia Minor would have been re- would have readily been able to identify with. OK, so it's very important to understand that throughout human history between the first and second comings of Christ in its many manifestations in as many different forms, we see uh, we see pictures of the beast acting itself out here in human history, especially as it relates to persecution against God's people. OK, and that's the that's the main activity that we see with the beast. We see a couple of things. We see him blaspheming God in the name of God and his people. That would be us, the church. We talked about that last time. And then his how he makes war against the saints and he conquers them. OK, and there's the persecution aspect of this. OK, now. As we're dealing with this whole thing with with saints and the saints who are under the heavy hand of the beast. It's like I like I alluded to at the at the beginning of this program. It's going to be important for us to have a right biblical and eternal perspective on things as they unfold um, in our time and in whatever way that the beast manifests itself and it can manifest itself in so many different ways. I will I will remind you that I think that primarily and for the most part it manifests itself through the institution of government in the state. I don't think that it necessarily is limited to that, but I think in large part it does. But however way it does that, you know, whether it shows up in, from in periods of time in our history, in our culture, in our society, in our country, or whether you see it in other places in the world, uh, you know, it's it's important for us to understand and to know um, that, um, you know, where our standing is with Christ. And that's going to be the major difference in giving us that eternal perspective. Because in this passage that we're looking at here in Revelation 13, we're, it's, it's almost as if we're, we're, we're making a comparison between two groups of people, those who dwell on earth and the saints, okay? And really, for the most part, the, at least as it relates to verse 8, uh, the description that we, that we see here is a description of the people of the world, those who dwell on earth um, and, you know, how their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. But in an indirect way, that kind of describe it, it. There's a description that describes us as well and our standing with Christ. And so it's important for us to understand and to recognize that just as the comparisons are being made. And as we're looking at that and we see what our destination is compared to what the world's destination is, you begin to see that, you know, we are in a much more blessed position, even though we're going through pain and trial right now under the hand of the beast. And that and that thought is going to be serve as kind of a foundation for what we're called to do as it relates to faith and endurance. OK, so since verse eight here in, in chapter 13 um, is um, it starts in mid sentence. Let me let me start in the middle of in the middle of verse seven. OK, and this is. This is still talking about the beast and what's true of the beast in the middle of verse seven, and then go into read into verse eight. And so in the middle of verse seven and and on through verse eight, it says, and authority was given it over it, the beast over every tribe and people and language and nation. And, and here's verse eight and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Now let's, let's just pause right there for a second. Uh, And I've already made mention of those who dwell on the earth. And I've already made this connection in several episodes past, but let me just remind you again that whenever in the book of Revelation it's talking about those who dwell on the earth, it's talking about people who don't have Christ, unbelievers, okay? And in the different in the different passages that you read in Revelation, I think that that's abundantly clear. So we understand that. So here we have, as it relates to the to the whole thing of, of the beast, we we have two categories of people here. We've already we've already seen one the saints and we've already seen that that war that the beast is waging war against the saints and conquering them, and then you have the other category here a category that's been mentioned before, and I'm pretty sure will be mentioned again, even even in in future passages in Revelation and those are those who dwell on the earth again unbelievers. So here we have this the, these two categories side by side, and when we get into verse eight, you know. It gives us a it gives actually let me tell you this it really gives us it gives us a perspective and gives us insight on those who dwell on the earth and why they do the things that they do because remember because it, it says here 
um, in, in in verse eight, and it says, "And all who dwell on earth will worship it, that worship the beast." And remember, uh, we we kind of talk, there we kind of talked about this in past episodes too, because it said in verse four. Um, it says, and they worship the dragon for he had given his authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like the beast and who, and who, who can fight against it. So the people of the, of the world and people of the earth marvel as, as scripture also says, marvel at this beast and they, and they, and they worship the dragon, i.e. Satan. They worship the dragon in an indirect sense, in the sense that they worship the beast and the beast was given power from and a mouth to utter haughty words from the dragon itself. Okay, so when you're dealing with people who dwell on the earth, i.e., unbelievers, and their and their natural um, uh, hatred towards God, you see that the people who dwell on the earth and the beast they're really of kindred spirit. I think that's the term that I used um, either last week or 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 the week before. I don't remember. These weeks are just kind of melding themselves t- together. I think many of you know what that's like, but um, they're really of the same mindset. I mean, and that's not surprising if, you know, if two groups, if the beast, you know, in whatever form, you know, of whatever group of people you're talking about and how it's manifest and those who dwell on the earth, you know, are unbelievers, they are of the same sinful nature that rebels against God. So when you have this beast that speaks out against God, the things of God, um, either ideologically, economically, but governmentally or whatever, even in some cases setting themselves up as God, um, you see, you know, that, you know, that anti-Jesus, anti-God sentiment is shared by those who dwell on the earth if they don't have Christ. That's just the natural thing of it. So when you have, you know, whether governmental systems, ideological systems that are lofted up in this world against God, the same God-hating spirit that indwells that philosophy or whatever you're talking about is going to connect in a sinfully spiritual way to those who dwell on the earth. Now, there's a lot of uh, there's other things that you can say as far as why the people of the earth dwell uh, who dwell on the earth worship the beast. We've already talked about that, but I mean, again, uh, this is kind of serves as a reminder to us that you know that we're dealing with again, just to use the term that I used before kindred spirits here and so it's not, it shouldn't be surprising to us that though that it's described that those who dwell on the earth worship the beast okay and so the nature of those who dwell on the earth and like i said verse 8 kind of gives us insight as to why we're seeing the things that we see from the people who dwell on the earth because as verse verse 8 goes on to say you know after it says that it says and all who dwell on the, on the earth will worship will worship it Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. Now, there's a lot in there. Verse eight, verse eight. I'm going to be honest with you. Verse eight can be a whole podcast episode in itself. We're not going to make it into that. OK, we're going to we're going to cover verses nine and ten as well. But we're, we'll, we'll do as best as we can to cover the substance of of verse eight, because there's a lot of things in there. But in a broader sense, let me just make finish the point that I was trying to make here is that we much can be explained. We're given insight into the, those who dwell on the earth and why they worship the beast in the sense that we're dealing with people who, you know, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So in other words, it's just highlighting all the more the fact that these are unbelievers. And we know that unbelievers by nature are against God and against the things of God. If you look at Romans 1, it labels them as, labels them as haters of God, right? So again, this is, this is showing us something that's, you know, giving us insight into, into the people who dwell on the earth. Now, I think it's going to be important for us to, you know, to to realize something here. And again, given the genre that we're dealing with here in the book of Revelation, it's important for us not to take this um, in so much in a literal sense that we miss the intent of what's going on here. What this passage isn't saying is not saying that if so, if a person's name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that from the time that they were born all the way to the end of their life or when Christ comes back, whichever comes first, that that person whose name is in the book never at all on this earth expressed any sort of rebellion, hatred, animosity toward God or Christians or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about. 
And if we don't understand Revelation and how it's written, that's how people would would might think that you know that's being said here in Revelation. Now I think you and I both know better. Okay, we know better than that. Um, but it's a, but I mean that for from a lay person's perspective or a novice, they might look at that and that's the impression that they would get. But it's important for us to acknowledge that that's not what we're talking about. Again, when we're dealing with these different visions, these different visions zero in on a particular event or span of time within between the first and second comings of Christ, and it has particular emphases. Now we know from a previous vision, and I'm referring mostly to chapter seven. Um, that we know that people from every tongue, tribe, people, and language, that there will be people who are brought into the fold uh, through salvation in Jesus Christ. We saw that before. So we know that even with the uh, every tribe, tongue, people, and language here in chapter 13, that it's not saying that every single person that makes up that category um, will never be saved. That's not the case. We saw in a previous vision that has a different focus and a different emphasis. We see that there will be people from that number that that become saved. So I don't. So we shouldn't get the impression here in chapter thirteen that those who dwell on the earth, in, that excuse me, that those people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It means that because their name is there from beginning of life to end of life, they never showed any sort of uh, animosity or or resistance to Christianity to Christ, or that they themselves did not worship the beast. You know, in 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 broader in a broader thought of theology. We can safely say, I mean, just based on the authority of Scripture and melding in the, the concepts and the illustrations that we're seeing here in Revelation, we know that there are people who have worshipped the beast in the past, but they don't anymore because they are now in Christ. Okay, so we know that that you know that that's true of people whose names are written in the book. But when you know that the name that's, that's written there, when they become saved, you know, we were dealing with a totally different creature here. And now they stand at odds and against the world system that that advances culturally, economically, governmentally, whatever case, and again, whatever manifestation it is, that stands against Jesus Christ. And now so you have these two opposing groups of people, those whose names are written in the book of life and those who have been saved and are new creatures in Christ and those who are not saved and those who dwell on the earth, Okay. And so that's that's what you have there. So again, when you look at verse eight here, it's talking about it's talking about it, it, it's mentioned with this whole thing with the Lamb's Book of Life. It's it's in in a direct sense, it's it's making reference to things related to those who dwell on the earth. In other words, that their names are not in there, but it does in an indirect way say a lot of things about those whose names are written in the Book of Life. Okay. Um, so it, when it ta- when it's talking about this this book of life here, again as it says it says these um, everyone whose name has not been written bef- now here listen to this before the foundation of the world. Now this causes people fits. This verse as well as a handful of others, mostly in the New Testament, that comes uh, could, that comes to the forefront when it's ever whenever it's talking about the whole debate between election um, and free will, Calvinism versus Arminianism. Um, And straight out, you know, uh, full disclosure here, and for those of you who are listeners, um, who have listened to me for a while, you already know this, um, but I believe in election. I think that the Bible is abundantly clear when it when it comes to things like this. And this is one of those areas of scripture where, again, we're, we're, we're hit head on with the reality of this whole thing. And it, 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 we we're, we come face to face with this whole idea of the sovereignty of God. And that's going to be, that's something that's very important for us to grasp onto, particularly in this passage, that God is sovereign. And we see that he has been sovereign from the very beginning. As it says there, this is something, as far as the names that, uh, the names that appear or don't appear in the book of life of the Lamb, this is all, uh, you know, as far as the the names that are written again it says it was written before the foundation of the world so before the world was even a thing the book of life your name was written in the book of life now let me just explain a little bit about this book because again we have to let's let's look at this reasonably here we're not talking about a literal book we're not talking about a literal 
you know, leather book with, with binding and with pages in it that, that Jesus Christ has up in heaven. And then at the end of the age, when he returns, he opens up this book. I know that that's the language that's used there. But again, that, that's language that's used to, in illustrative purposes, to give us an idea of what's happening in that passage. Now, this whole thing of books is not the only place. I mean, Revelation is not the only place where you see this, uh, where you see this uh, sort of thing, you know, brought up. Uh, for example, in Exodus chapter thirty-two. Uh, specifically in verses 32 to 33 are talking about, you know, the whole thing of please do not blot me, you know, you know, blot us out of your book. And it doesn't say the book of life of the lamb, but, you know, it's it's a book of some kind. And it talks about, you know, blotting people or not blotting people's names or blotting them out of God's book. Right. You see the same thing in places like uh, like Psalm 69, verse 28. You see it in Daniel. Right. And, and let me read let me read this one in Daniel, actually, um, in chapter 12. And I think that the that this reference to the book and again, it's not it's not referred to necessarily as the book of life of the lamb. Um, but it is. Um, um, but I do believe that it is referring to the same book um, that's referred to in uh, in uh, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. And this is seen in Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 1. And it says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time oops, sorry, the shield covering on the on the uh, on the microphone was kind of doing funny things there. Sorry. Let me start over verse 1. Um, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as n- has never been since there was a nation till there till that time uh, but at that time your people shall be dis- uh, shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found written in the book and because of the eschatological nature and the and the kind of comparisons that you can see between that and the new testament I don't think it's a stretch to say that the book that's mentioned in in Daniel chapter 12 is the same book of life that we're talking about here in Revelation 13 in Revelation 13. That's that's my opinion there. So there you see that that uh you know that reference as well. And even later in the in the book of Revelation you see you know the same language about the book and people's names not written in the book of the life uh, book of life of the lamb. You see that in chapter 17 verse 8 of Revelation. We see it in the final judgment passage in Revelation chapter 20. I want to draw your attention to that um here a little bit. Um, and then also in Revelation twenty one twenty seven, where it says that only those people whose names are written in the in the book of life um, have access and entry into the into the the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so you see this whole idea of of a book, um, and actually one other place, um, and this is important to realize, um, because in uh, in Revelation chapter three. Um, remember when we were looking at the uh, uh, the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor, and um, in chapter three um, and in verse five, um, this is the letter to the church in Sardis, one of the ch- one of the one of the churches that didn't have any uh, commendation in it. Um, in verse five, it says, "The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life." OK, so at, le- at least with there. And again, if you remember how the how the letters are patterned, we know that everything that's spoken of past the to the one who conquers section is talking about promises that are afforded to the whole church and not just to that local church that's being addressed. So really, one thing that we know about the book of life um, that is uh, that is plain and clear that we see in chapter three is that no one's name is blotted out of that book. Okay, nobody's nobody's name is blotted out of that book, and that really makes sense if we're talking about names that were written before the foundation of the world. Okay, so God has all of this in control. This again shows the sovereignty of God, and this whole thing with book, you know, it. it, it the way that the first century audience would have would have understood it is kind of like a, a registry within a city or a town or a village or something like that that has the, the names of citizens of that 
of that town or that locality that's there. Um, and, you know, it could, you know, based on certain uh, factors, whether you're a malcontent or, you know, some other sorts of things, your name could be removed from that book. Here, we're talking about a book where your name in a, in a sort of a registry sort of thing, your name is registered as a citizen of a of a place or a thing. Now, where now what is that specifically talking about? You know, we are all we could say, you know, as, and as even as we talked about before last time, citizens of heaven and we are citizens of a kingdom that is now. And that in the in the in the ultimate makeup of that kingdom was predetermined by God before the foundation of the world. So this was this was this was if this was God's plan before the foundation of the world, you know, not to mention the fact just from New Testament theology, the theology that you can't lose your salvation for several different reasons that we won't go into that because that's not the subject of this of this episode. But we understand that your name, which is written, which was written in the book before the foundation of the world will never be erased from there. OK, so the sovereignty of God so the security that we have in God, you know, um, is also a comforting thing that we should that we should take note of as well. So when it talks about book, the book of life, it, it, it's supposed to give us this understanding of what many other people in the first century would have would have understood as far as a book is concerned, as it relates to names of citizens within a certain registry, you know, as it relates to their town or their village or something like that. OK, and that's what we're talking about here, except this is a much grander book in the sense that we are we are citizens of a greater thing. And that is the kingdom. OK, you and I are citizens of a kingdom and our and our names are there in the in the in the kingdom register that shows that we belong to that kingdom. I think that that's that that's pretty that's pretty neat. That's pretty interesting. So we have. The sovereignty of God laid out here, the security of God, just based on what we what we've seen in other in in a, in a previous passage of Scripture here in Revelation. Okay, so this has been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. Okay, now this isn't just a book; this is a book of life. Okay, and really, because the the, the reason why it's called the book of life, I think I think the explanation can be what's 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 highlighted right there after that in the book of life of the lamb. Okay. This is the lamb's book. This is the book that belongs to the lamb and in the, in the book and in the book is names of people that belong to him because this is Christ's kingdom. This is the lamb's kingdom. So if we're connected with the lamb, we are connected to his kingdom. And when we are connected to the lamb, when we are connected to Jesus Christ, we have life through him. Okay. Eternal life. That's why it's called the Book of Life of the Lamb. So I guess in a real sense, not only does it, this show our citizenship and where our citizenship lies, but it also shows that our name that our names is in the, is among the list of people who have true life. And that's very important to understand. It's very important for the first century audience to to understand, and it's certainly important for us to understand as well. You know, things might you know there might be moments when things aren't the way that we would ideally like to see them just as far as the world coming against the church, not just in the United States, but in other places in the world, you know, situations might not be ideal, but that doesn't mean that we don't possess true authentic life. We have life, life eternal in the sun. Okay. And so that book, your name and my name written in that book shows that we have life. We have true life in the Lamb. And listen, if we have true life, does, is it going to make any difference if our, if our lives are taken away on this earth here? No, really, it, 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 that's not going to make much of a difference. You know, I, and that's not to say that we treat our lives haphazardly here, but and when it comes to persecution, and especially when it, and when it relates to martyrdom, if somebody is martyred for the Christian faith, is it really that big of a thing when you compare the fact that we have life eternal in the sun that's not dependent on whether we are alive or dead in this life on this earth no it doesn't make that doesn't make a difference at all because we do have eternal life that is the life that truly matters so whether we are alive or whether we're dead that life is secure okay and i think that that's what it highlights there when the book is called the book of life 
of the Lamb. And again, as I said, it's 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 the Lamb's book that that lists the names of people who belong to the Lamb. So it's the, the your name and my name in this book highlights the fact that we are citizens of His kingdom. Okay, that we were put there before the foundation of, a, of the world according to God's sovereign purpose. Okay, that we belong to him, that we belong to the lamb, and that we have life eternal through him. That's what's indicated there when, when we have the when it when it comes to this whole thing of our names being written in the book of life of the lamb. Now, those people who are of the earth, those who dwell on the earth, again, as it says there, their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So they do not have life eternal in the Son, and they are not connected to the Lamb, okay? And that explains why they easily are held sway to the beast and why they worship the beast and why they marvel at the beast. Because again, I'm going to say it again, the people who dwell on the earth and the beast, they are of kindred spirits. Those who are in Christ and whose names are written in the book of life, they are different creatures, okay? And so those two categories of people are at odds with one another. And that's what you have going on there. So uh, so whose name um, has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb. And here's how everything with the the Lamb and our names being written in it is made possible. Who was slain? Okay. We've been introduced to this whole thing of the slain Lamb before in in Revelation chapter 5. Remember, we're we're in heaven, in the vision in heaven, we see a lamb as though it had been slain, though it is standing, okay? And that, and the slain lamb, you know, Christ, our our slain lamb, is, is the lamb of sacrifice that paved the way for us to enter in by faith because that, that, that sacrifice was for our sins, right? And through faith in Jesus Christ, we enter into a right relationship with God. Our sins are forgiven, Right. And and we get you and we have eternal life. We receive eternal life by his grace. And because we have that life, you know, that that's again explains why our names are written in that in that book of life of the lamb, which, again, those names were written before the foundation of the world. Okay, so all of this, I mean, when you really just take some take a moment to consider all of that, you understand the true, awesome and eternal blessings that we have, even though in this life the world comes against us. And you know, the, the whole thing is, and we'll, we'll get a sense of this even when we look at chapter 17, but you know, you kind of get the sense of it here in chapter 13 is that, you know, all you need to do is align yourself with the beast and your trouble will be, will be reduced significantly because they won't come against you because of your stance in Christ now. Okay. And so it could be, it could be a whole thing where, you know, the, the, the threat is given, align yourself with the beast and, and you'll be okay. You won't have to suffer this, this, you know, you know, this trouble in this life anymore. That's, that's the threat that's given. If you don't line up with that, then there's going to be trouble for you. But here's the thing. This life is fleeting. This life has nothing to offer you. This life is going to end. So why, so why, you know, compromise something that is of higher value for something that's temporal and doesn't have any value? That doesn't make any sense, right? So having that thought of of what we're dealing with here as far as eternal life that is of much greater value than anything that this life has to offer you know, we wouldn't want to align ourselves with the beast who is, uh, who offers nothing, who can do nothing. He tries to mimic the lamb because, and remember, we talked about that before as part of the whole thing of the, of the one of its heads that was wounded as if it was, as if it was wounded, the same language that's used to talk about the lamb as if it had been slain, right? There's a, there's a mimicking between the beast and the lamb but there's far greater value in the lamb. And we see that all throughout the book of Revelation. We're going to see that more as we as we continue to unfold the texts here as we go further into the book. Okay, but eternal life versus the life here that is temporal, um, you know, it's not even fair comparing all of those things. You know, so um, 
so there you kind of have an understanding and, and really when you when you latch on to that understanding and that perspective it really does something about how we view the here and now is even when we look at things as they are right now the comforting thing that we can that we can establish in, in our hearts and in our minds is that this is not the end of the story this is not how things are going to stay and there will come a day when victory will be fully and finally secured And because our names are written in the book of life, we will be spared of the judgment that is to come. That's where Revelation 20 comes in. And I do. And I said I was going to read this to you and I'm just going to I'll just I'll just read it here. We don't need to go into deep detail here um, because obviously when we get to this point, we'll we'll talk about it at greater length. Um, But in chapter 20, verse 15, plain and clear right here. It says, and if anyone's name, this is at the end of the age, okay, just to set the the stage there, but it says, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into a lake of fire. So those whose names are not in there, you know, they don't have the eternal life. Where do they go? They go in the lake of fire, i.e. hell, right? So that's, so that's. That's the that's the destination of those whose names are not written in the book of life. Our names are there. So why would we want to align ourselves or be pressured into aligning ourselves with people whose destination is nothing but judgment? That doesn't make any sense either. So having an understanding, uh, an eternal perspective really helps us out in the here and now. We know that we are under pressure, trial, persecution, everything like that. But because we know who we are of, who we belong to, the fact that the Lamb of God is the victor and that our names are written in the book of life, showing that we do have life and that we are connected to him who has the victory, we know that greater time is ahead when it comes to the end of the age and entering onto the other side of eternity. Okay. And so we don't have to be overcome with worry, with doubt, um, with fear in this present life because of your because of your standing and because of the fact that your name is written in that book. Okay. So, as it says there, if anyone has an ear, this is verse nine of chapter thirteen. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, again, this that phrase takes us back to what we've seen in the in the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, okay? Which you know, those those were words that were uttered by Christ, you know, through in letter form to the people um in those seven churches. So again, I think that this gives us a clue when we read it here in verse 9, if anyone excuse me, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. We understand now what we're dealing with. We're dealing these are words that are given to the church. Okay, so that takes us back to this whole thing that we're not talking about. Um, we're not talking about a, a, a group of people who are tribulation saints, which, according to dispensationalist teaching, that's not necessarily the same as the church, because the church, according to that system, has been raptured. So the church is not on earth, but earth. But you do have Christians who are tribulation saints. No, what we see in the same way that we saw with the churches in Asia Minor. In the letters to them, we see here in chapter 13, which I think should give us a clue that the saints that we're dealing with here are Christians, and they're Christians that exist between the first and second comings of Christ. And and, and also, you know, and obviously it has a direct um, uh, relatability to that first century audience, to those churches in Asia Minor, where it says, where it does say, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Okay, and I and let me just take a moment, and I'll do this as quickly as I can to to make this comment here. Because again, we're dealing with saints here. And again, I'm saying that we're real, dealing with saints between the first and second comings of Christ. It's very important that we that we that we understand that because in dispensational teaching, and maybe you've been exposed to this, and maybe this is something you're wrestling with as you're listening to me talk and trying to figure out how how certain things fit in. One of the things that is believed within the within the dispensational system is that during this time of tribulation, if we're looking at this through the lens of a seven year tribulation, is that the beast is also persecuting Jews. Okay, because because remember, as as the, as a system goes, and as what people believe and how things are interpreted in places like Daniel chapter nine, 
regarding that 70th week of Daniel, the Antichrist supposedly uh, uh, signs a peace treaty with Israel, and they are able to resume animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple. Now, keep in mind that w- the Jews that are talked about here um, in this in this system are unbelieving Jews. They're they're picking up their whole their whole system of Judaism, but it's not it's not connected to Christ. This is just regular Judaism without Christ. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here, and I think this is a very, this is important for us to understand in light of what we're seeing here in revelation 13 is that you can't have, because let me just finish the the point I was making with, with the belief with the Jews, because they they have reinstituted sacrifices. And then in the middle of the week, the antichrist goes, you know, breaks the covenant with them. And then he oppresses and, uh, and persecutes these Jews. So when you take that consideration, and that's mostly drawn from a dispensational understanding of Daniel chapter 9, and what you see here in Revelation 13, you have two contradictory things going on here. And I don't think, I, I, th- I really do think that they're mutually exclusive. Now, I've heard the explanation here, you know, a couple of times where are saying, well, the beast persecutes the Jews because he's mad. He doesn't like the Jews because it's from the Jews that the, that the, uh, that the Messiah came from. And my whole thing is, what difference does that make if you're talking about a Jewish people who don't recognize Jesus as their their Messiah? That doesn't make any sense. So I don't think that that's really a a reasonable explanation here. But but again, when you compare that sort of thought to what we're dealing with here in Revelation chapter 13, if we're dealing with those who dwell on the earth versus those whose names are written in the book of life, right? If your name is not written in the book of life, what are you doing if you're in, these are people. These are people who don't acknowledge Christ and they reject Christ. That would include Jews who do not embrace Jesus as their Messiah. So they would be just as much part of those who dwell on the earth as other people who make up the Gentile world. And that would also mean that their names are not written in the book of life. So they are, they would be, if we're talking about unbelieving Jews, and again, we're just looking at this through the dispensational system and trying to reason from that lens. If we're dealing with Jews that aren't that don't embrace Jesus as their Messiah, then according to Revelation 13, they are the ones worshiping the beast, not being persecuted by him. Why are they worshiping the beast, but then they're being persecuted by the beast? That doesn't make any sense. If they don't embrace Jesus as their Messiah and they're they're rejecting Christ, then they are of the category of those who dwell on the earth. And it says that those who dwell on the earth are worshiping the beast. And that is in distinction to those whose names are written in the book of life. Whose names are written in the book of life? Saints, the church, made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. OK, so again, I, I, and I and I feel that it's now is a, is a good time to, to bring that up because that is a very popular and widespread belief that many people have because they've been exposed to the dispensational understanding of this. But I, I want you to understand that when it comes to that understanding and what we have here in Revelation 13, that those two notions contradict themselves. Those are mutually those are mutually exclusive. That, I mean, if we if we take. From a again, from a dispensational lens, and we take it at face value, we understand that 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 those two concepts can't hold can't hold together. Okay, so all that to say, again, you know, just in connection to verse nine, what we're dealing with here exclusively is the church. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. The same language used here as we saw addressed to the churches in Asia Minor. In, uh, in chapters 2 and 3. And in verse 10, I think what we're exposed to here is a, a, a more of, a, 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 of an instance of what we see with the sovereignty of God. Verse 10, if anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Now, this is kind of, I think this is kind of a melding together of, 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 of two things that are drawn from the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah. 
um, in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 2, and then also in chapter 43, verse 11, is where that's drawn from. You just kind of have a combination of those things. You can look up those verses on your own. We won't have, we won't turn and look at those now, but look at those on your own. That's again, that's Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 2, and chapter 43, verse 11. What's interesting about those Old Testament contexts is that those words are said in context, I believe, to um, judgment against people who are against the people of God, so God's enemies. Um, Whereas here in Revelation 13, that one-for-one sort of thing isn't exact. We're not dealing with, at least I don't believe anyway, in, in chapter 13, verse 10 of Revelation, that this is referring to words regarding unbelievers or the enemies of God. But this is something that's showing what is ahead for the church, for believers, um, you know, in between the first and second comings of Christ. And in the immediate context, those who existed in the first century. But the idea is whether you're talking about believers or unbelievers, believers here in chapter 13 or unbelievers in, in the Old Testament context in the book of Jeremiah, um, is God's sovereignty. And, and he's already determined how this is going to be laid out. And that God is in control of this. And even as it relates to persecution against his people. Remember, we saw a hint of this back in chapter 6 when we were talking about the seal judgments. And we were talking specifically about the fifth seal with the soul of the martyrs. Remember, the souls of the martyrs asked um, how long until until we are vindicated. That's just a summary phrase of it. Um, and it says that they have, they have to wait a little, a little while longer until the number of martyrs is completed, which shows you that God is in control even of that. He's determined how many people of his own people are going to die a martyr's death. And so here we see, even though it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not anything that we would like to dwell upon, I would much rather see this whole thing of persecution, even when it comes to captivity or martyrdom, that even that being in the hands of God, than persecution and captivity and martyrdom outside the hands of a non-sovereign God, okay? If we understand who our God is, then we can understand that even when it comes to persecution, God is in control, okay? And so it says, you know, to, uh, if anyone is taken, is to be taken captive, to captivity, he goes. And that captivity, I think, might, you know, in a, in a certain sense, be just be, be referenced to people who are thrown in prison. And again, I've mentioned this before. I've mentioned this a while back. Usually with prison, prison was very short term, it, it short lived. It's not necessarily, at least from the first century context, um, it wasn't simply a matter of you, you serve a certain prison sentence. Usually you're in prison to await trial or execution. Um, now, in, a tw- in the course of history, and if we're talking about between the first and second comings of Christ, you know, things might look a little different where captivity is captivity for long periods of time. And certainly Christians all throughout history have had to deal with that. You know, because of their faith in Christ, they've been captured, they've been thrown in prison, and they've languished there. Some people have been have been sent to labor camps, um, you know, and you have you, know, you have people who are who are locked up because of their because of because of that. That is something that is not slipped outside of the hands of God. It's not like God is not in control of those things, okay. And God has a, has has a, has a specific purpose as it relates to all of that. But it says that anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Now, it's interesting, you know, this kind of shows us in, in, in a very, you know, small way what kind of identification we have with our Savior because our Savior was one who was slain as well. Now, his has a salvific effect to it. For those who enter in by faith into a right relationship with him. So, but the fact of the matter is that he would, you know, even though according to the preordained plan purposes of God and stuff that was in his control, he was slain by the hands of people who hated him. Okay. Let's understand that. And so with our connection with Christ, there is also that hatred that was aimed at Christ that is also aimed at us. We talked about that last time as well. Okay, so that is the reality that that we enter into 
where the hatred that people have for Christ is something that is ours. And for many Christians, again, in the past, in the present, and even in the future until the time that Christ comes back, the people share in that slaying, uh, you know, the, the slaying of his people just as Christ himself was slain. Right, they suffer the same sort of sufferings that Christ has suffered. Now, of course, with with Christians being slain, you know, we're not talking about in a salvific sense for other people, obviously. But um, and the words, the word for slain um, that is related to the lamb in verse eight, in what we see here in verse ten, the Greek words are different, but I, but I think that the concept is still very interesting. I think you can make some connections and correlations to that. These are people who have connected themselves to the lamb who had been slain. He is standing now, which means he's living and he's been raised from the dead. But our connection to him has invited persecution on us. And for many of those people, they have been slain as well due to the hatred that is aimed towards them from people of the world. Just as it just as uh, just as was the reality of Jesus Christ. And that reminds us that should remind us of something that we talked about last time in the sense that we we because of our connection with Christ, we shouldn't expect better treatment than our Savior received. Okay, because of our association with the name of Christ, we can expect the world to come against us. Okay, that's the idea here. But all of this, again, a part of the sovereignty of of Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God, that even in those areas, captivity, martyrdom, you know, whatever we're talking about here is in the sovereign hand of God. And so in the last part there, verse 10, you have that whole thing of here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Okay. Given what we now know, this is the right response. The whole thing of here is is it kind of has this idea of this is how you are to respond in light of what we of what we what we've been exposed to the truths that we've been exposed to the truths that we're supposed to lock into our hearts and our minds this is the right response here is a call for endurance and faith of the saints we have there's no reason for us for our faith to falter given what we now know, especially if we're dealing with a lamb that, yes, he was slain. But remember from chapter five, what do we see in that lamb? A lamb who's standing, which shows that he was resurrected from the dead. I'm sticking with him. OK, the whole thing of the of the wound of the beast that was uh, that looked as if it had been wounded but it had been healed. That's counterfeit. We'll talk a little, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that the further we the further we go go down here. Probably going to be a little bit later as we go into chapter 13. But Jesus Christ is alive. We're sticking with him. I mean, that in itself can be reason enough for us to put our faith to put to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be enough. Right? And so our, our faith, you know, and, and, and again, with everything else that we've talked about up to this point, the sovereignty of God and everything being in his control, I put my faith in him. He knows the end from the beginning. He's the one who's written the script. Okay. And we have, and we are called to endurance. We're called to endure these things, given what we now know. This is an endurance, by the way, that, that, uh, that John himself relates to as well. He talked about the patient endurance that he himself was had, you know, because of his own persecutions of being exiled on the Isle of Patmos, right? And that that endurance speaks a great word to the people on the outside world. And granted, this isn't the focus of this of this vision, but I think that when we're talking about the endurance, if we endure and we stick with Christ and we cling to Christ, even when situations are dire and the world is coming against us, our endurance and our clinging to Christ and to our confession says a great word to certain people of the world. And that has an effect and a bearing on people coming into salvation due to that testimony of of that endurance. Because what they see in that endurance is a group of people who hold great value in Christ, so much so that they are able to endure the harshest and cruelest of persecutions and are willing to lay down their lives for this, thus showing how much much value they put in the person of Christ and their relationship and their confession. 
And I think that God uses that to bring people into the kingdom. Now, this whole thing of bringing people into the kingdom, we, we, you know, as it relates to the book of Revelation, we saw this before in chapters in chapter seven. We're going to talk about it a little bit more when we get to chapter 20, which some of you, if you're familiar with Revelation and what con- and what is contained in the book of Revelation, might find that a little bit odd. I don't necessarily blame you, but there's a good explanation for all of that. And we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 20, which will be a little while from now. Um, but, but again, all of this that we that we see that, and, and especially the things that we've seen, the truths that we've been exposed to as it relates to the Lamb's book of life, those things are a great foundation for us to give us the eternal perspective that we need to, to, uh, to live and respond in the way that we are to respond in the latter part of, of, of verse 10 here with faith and endurance. Okay. Which, by the way, I mean, this is this again, I think the the call to faith and endurance and everything like that makes much more sense if this is being aimed at saints uh, contextually, you know, in the immediate context, the the first century audience with which many of them are going through persecutions already. But even if we're seeing saints in this vision being the between the first and second comings of Christ, it fits that category a lot more than it does people, saints who are who are who are going through trouble in a seven year tribulation period. Because really think about it, if you're within the seven year tribulation period, and let's say that you're even in the latter part of that, in the latter part of that seven year tribulation period, and let's say that 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 six that uh, that you've already passed six years and and persecution is still going on strong, I would imagine that martyrdom is less and less of a fearful thing, is less and less of an intimidating thing if you have an understanding of how things are working out. And even if it comes to loved ones and seeing loved ones getting beheaded or shot or something like that, I mean, if you have an understanding of Scripture as a tribulation saint, again, looking at this from a dispensational lens, the whole thing is like, okay, I guess in a sense that's bad, but I'm going to see him in another year. You know, the thing, the difference between that and what we see in the here and now in the present age is that even with loved ones who are who are murdered and martyred for the Christian faith, I mean, it's not a it's not a tragic story in the sense that they are now with the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, there is a certain sense of sadness because we are, you know, we're we've departed, they've departed from us and we don't and we will see them again, but we don't know when that will be. You know, and that's what makes, you know, stuff like this a lot harder. And the in the encouragement for faith and endurance in that context, it makes a lot more sense than if you're dealing with a seven year tribulation period In a seven year tribulation period. It's like, OK, that's bad. I'm going to see them soon, though, very soon. And I know about what time that's going to be, given where we are in the tribulation. And even when it comes to ourselves and the threat of death to ourselves, I mean, you know, it would be like, okay, I'll miss out on the last three, two, four years or whatever of this life that there is going to be before Christ comes back and everything's made right. So again, really, it's not going to make much of a difference when you understand this. So the, the exhortation makes more sense when you look at the saints in chapter 13 as not being tribulation saints. Does that make sense? So this this speaks a word directly to the immediate audience, the first century audience, and it speaks a word to us today, because these are things that while it well it, it, it can it connected to, to the original audience, it it still has effect on us today because we're dealing with saints between the first and second comings of Christ. Okay, so when we see the things around us, take heart, friends. Take heart because your name, my name, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which shows us that we are on the winning side. Remember, that's part of the theme that we're seeing here. And I think that's what that's one of the big things that's that's being communicated to the audience that the, um, of Revelation, that you in Christ are on the winning side. Even when the world is coming against you, never forget that you are on the winning side. OK, now. We're not done seeing the trouble that 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 arises as it relates to things going on here uh, within human history between the first and second comings of Christ. We've been introduced to the first beast. Now, next time, as we go further into chapter 13, we're going to be introduced to the second beast, also known uh, within theological discussion as the false prophet. 
Now, what's his deal? What's his role in this whole thing in connection to the beast and to the dragon and everything like that, and even to the people of God, the church? That is what we're going to talk about next time. But for now, we're going to leave it there. All right. If you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts. You'll also do so on iHeartRadio, Spotify, and YouTube. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. You, my friends, are on the winning side. Never forget that. And while things might be tough here, and in some times, and in some cases in human history, and even in our time, our contemporary time, things like may be looking to get worse and the pressure is put on, understand and, and realize and recognize and remember who you're connected to and your standing in Christ and your, in, your, in the place of your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And from that perspective, you get a clearer picture of, of, of how things are going to be as it relates to the end and the ultimate victory that you have in Jesus Christ. What we see here, the things that go on here, is not a forever reality. This is, this is not going to last forever. Praise God for that. Final victory is coming. All of this calls for faith and endurance of the saints. All right. Well, I enjoyed our time that we had in Scripture together. I, thought, I think we looked at a lot of great things. I hope it blessed you. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.